Hi, I'm Semin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled PSPY Simulation of Active Power Factor Correction Inductor Current and Core Losses. And I'm dealing here primarily with CCM. Active Power Factor Correction is required to comply with the standard concerning the line harmonics. Typically, we have the line, we have a rectifier, then we have a boost stage, in switch, inductor, and diode, then the output stage, this represents the load, and then we have a controller. In the classical approach, we'll be sensing the output in order to keep it constant, independent of load changes, sense the input voltage as a reference, and then the current of the inductor, this is the current of the inductor, which is actually reflected to the input as the control variable that we are going to set to follow the sinusoidal waveform of the input. So typically the waveform would look like this, this is the AC line, this is the rectified AC here, and then we have the inductor current, which will have a low frequency component, the line frequency, plus the ripple. We have the ripple superimposed on the inductor current. So the objective of this video is to estimate by simulation the high frequency ripple component of the inductor current. The inductor current contains both a low frequency and high frequency component. The high frequency component are important because of the skin effect as the current is becoming higher and higher, we are going to use thicker wire, larger diameter wire. If this is a solid wire, then we are going to have the skin effect and the high frequency component is also passing through this portion here. So if this high frequency component is appreciable, then we have to consider the use of Leeds wire. For that, we do need an estimate of this high frequency, the RMS, of the high frequency component of the inductor current, which is not constant along the uh, time interval, along the period of the line. For the estimation of the core losses, we do need the deviation of the magnetic flux density. And again, we do need the high frequency component because the high frequency component has the major effect on the losses, similar to the uh, skin effect, you might say. And what we see here is that the losses in terms of uh, power per volume are related to the frequency, and these are these lines, and then to the deviation of this high frequency component. So we do need an estimate of this high frequency component in order to estimate the core losses. So these are the objective to get these two uh, high frequency components from uh, simulation. Now the strategy that I'm going to use is to set up a piecewise model of a power factor correction stage, including the power plus the control. And then I'm going to extract the ripple current and get from this the RMS of the high frequency component. I'm going to estimate again the deviation of the magnetic flux density by simulation. And then to use the Steinmetz equation uh, in order to estimate the core losses. So this is the way we're going to proceed here in this video. The control of the power factor correction stage that I'm going to use is the so-called control without sensing of input voltage. It is not a must for the method I'm showing because I am after the waveform and you can get the waveform with different control, uh, different stages, and this is just the way that I'm doing it here. I'm using this particular control method, which is described in a number of papers, but here are two papers uh, that describe this method. And I've put a link to PDF of these papers at the page of this YouTube video, so you can click these links uh, at the page of the YouTube video and get uh, the PDFs of these two papers. So what is the idea of this control without sending the input voltage. Here we have the stage again. This is the AC rectifier boost output section, and here is the control. 
Control has actually two parts. This is the control of the current, and then we have the output voltage control section. Here, we are measuring just the current of the inductor, or the current of the input, you might say, rectified. And from this, we generate, actually, the duty cycle. Now, in order to accommodate the variation of the load, we compare the output to a reference, and if needed, we're actually changing constant here so as to modify the magnitude of the current to be larger or lower. Now, the way this control operates is based actually on the average model of a boost converter. This is the boost converter. We are in the input, the switch, the diode, and the average model shown here consists of the inductor, input voltage, and then the average voltage on this side. This is equal to D off times V out because the voltage here is V out, approximately, save the diode of voltage, is V out, the voltage here is V out whenever the transistor is not conducting. So taking into account the duty ratio, the average voltage at this point is D off times V out. And similarly, the output current is D off times IL because again the current is flowing when the transistor is not conducting, the current, the inductor current is flowing to the output, and again the ratio here is D off. This is not important for our discussion, this is important for our discussion. Now in steady state, the voltage, the average voltage on an inductor must be zero, otherwise there will be a drift of the current. So we assume that these two are equal at steady state, uh, that is averaging over a cycle or a number of cycles. So we have the average voltage at the input, the average voltage seen at the other hand being equal. Now I'm dividing these two by the input current. This is also the input current because this is the inductor current. I'm just using different labels here uh, for a uh, better explanation of what's going on. So I've just divided these two by this current. When doing this, you notice that this ratio here, V in over I in, is in fact the input resistance to the stage. Now power factor correction, active power factor correction, is a stage that needs to have a constant input resistance. This is the whole idea, because if you have a constant input resistance, then for a sinusoidal voltage, you'll get a sinusoidal current. So this is actually the objective behind an active power factor correction, to behave like a uh, resistive load toward the line. So it turns out that this resistance is equal to uh, this expression here, and reworking it, we get this control law, which is the basic idea of this control. And what it says is that if you will make D off proportional to the instantaneous average inductive current, this is the low frequency component, times this constant, you will get a resistive behavior of this value. So in this control method, all you have to do, you have to measure just the inductor current, multiply it by a constant, and from this generate D of proportional to this instantaneous value, that is by cycle by cycle. Now the way to do it is the following. We put a sense resistor here. Here is the current flowing through the sense resistor. We have a low pass filter here to get the low frequency component of the inductor current. And then we multiply it actually by a constant to generate T on, or T off you might say, which is the complementary. Now how we do this, we can do it by a comparator. We have a ramp, and we compare this ramp to the average current of the inductor. And whenever the ramp is lower than this current, it'll be T off, and whenever the 
ramp is higher than the inductor current, uh, it'll be T on. So this is D off or T off being proportional to the inductor current. You see this is a straight line, so this magnitude here is proportional to this height. And this is exactly what we need to have it here. Now the slope of this ramp is actually determining this constant. So this outer loop will actually uh, change the slope if required in order to adjust the current level. So what we have to do then is to have a comparator and feed a ramp to one input, the inductor current, the AC low frequency component of the inductor current, uh, the other input and generate the T on and this is all that we need in order to control this stage and to make it a active power factor correction stage. And here is a piecewise implementation with some uh, variation to simplify things. First of all, rather than having a input AC and a bridge rectifier, I've put here a behavioral model, a E value. This expression here, here it is, is actually uh, generating a rectified line voltage. It says this is the absolute value of 113 and this is sinusoidal waveform of 50 Hertz. Now this is 113 because I'm assuming a low voltage line with an 80 volt RMS, which is 130 volt peak. So this is one modification I have. This is then the inductor diode. Here, because I'm not going to control a load, I've just put a voltage source, 400 volt. We have a ideal switch. The current is sensed by this one milliohm resistor. This is the current of the inductor. Here it is. And we have a low pass filter. This is the raw inductor current and this is after filtering the high frequency, this is the low frequency. So here we have also a ramp, this is a germ, uh, 100 kilohertz and it's uh, uh, ramping to a maximum of 10 volts and then with a fall time of 0.2 uh, just to generate the ramp. So we need the voltage of the ramp, we need this voltage to put into a comparator but rather than using a comparator, I've used another capability of piecewise that is a uh, logic uh, expression. And this is an if statement. And it says that if the V ramp is lower than uh, this value, which is the voltage across the sense resistor times 1000, because this is 1 milliohm. Uh, it'll be zero, otherwise it'll be 10 volt. This is exactly what we need in order to generate with this comparator. This is just emulating a comparator and then the output is fed to the switch, this ideal switch. So this is now a power factor correction, which has a 113 peak value of, of sinusoidal input voltage. It has a inductor 500 microhenry and I'm running it at one kilohertz. And the constant here that is uh, for this comparison, there's no constant here, so I'm just leaving the constant to be one and it'll come up to be a certain value. If I like to change the count level, I need to put here a constant, we'll see it uh, later on. And here are the results. This is the input, the rectified input voltage. This green is the inductor current, and the inside of it is the average voltage as measured by the sense resistor. So in this particular case, we find that the peak value of this uh, AC current at the input or the rectified is about uh, three amp here, uh, so that um, the RMS is 3 over square root of 2, so this is 2.1 amp. So this is the low frequency component, but we are interested in the high frequency component. So what can we do? This is, by the way, the high frequency component that we are interested in to extract it uh, from the full waveform. So what can we do? We have here 
the raw inductor current that is low frequency and high frequency and here we have only the low frequency so if I subtract from this this DC I'll get the high frequency component and that's what I need so here it is this is just the difference between the two so we see only the high frequency component and then I can get the RMS value of this thing and this is exactly what I need this is the RMS of the high frequency component that is the ripple component of the inductor current which turns out to be this is due to the um, average uh, function which takes the time to stabilize and we find it to be about 350 milliamp this is RMS now so this is the first part that I wanted to get and that is the RMS value of the high frequency component of the inductor current now what about the core losses now core losses are a function of magnetic flux deviations and the frequency of these deviations so if we have a deviation like this we are interested in this value because this is for a sinusoidal excitation and B hat is just one side this is the peak value of the sinusoidal waveform and the best I can do here without going into uh, some unknown territory um, I can assume that this is just about a like a sinusoidal waveform and assume that this now if I have this B hat I can either use the curves or use the actually the fitted equation this is the Steinmetz equation this is a curve fitting fitted equation and what it says is there is a constant which in fact is a function of temperature but all these are constant known this is the frequency at the time running power of alpha and this is this exactly b hat that i need okay and this is to the power of beta and it turns out that beta or the all these constants are dependent on the operating point and i'll just assume that beta is 2.9 in this particular uh, presentation um, of course it should be chosen as per the application you are looking at so the b can be found from the current because the current is affecting the magnetic field magnetic field is related to magnetic flux density etc but if you go this way you do need information about the permeability and about the inductance and you don't have it uh, often and it's a better way much simpler and straightforward without any uh, unknowns is to look at the relationship between the voltage and the flux and we can extract here the voltage to be equal to n times a e a sub e is the cross section area of the core n is the number of turns of the windings dbdt the derivative of b and then therefore the integral of b of b of or b will be equal to 1 over n a sub e integral of vt which we call volt second vt okay so the b is equal to 1 over n a sub e all these are known from the structure of the inductor times the volt second which is this integral so this is what we have to get b is related to vt and b hat that is the maximum value which i need is related to the maximum value of this integral once i have this i can put it into the steinmetz equation this is the b and the b then will be this value here and it'll be to the power of beta and this is to the power of beta so the key here is to get the volt second across the inductor volt second across the inductor i need this the hat this is the peak value and then i'll raise it to the power of beta now p spice has an operator an integrator sdt that will do the integration of a voltage and in this case the difference between a and b va minus vb this is the voltage across the inductor so this is the built-in 
operator that um, piecewise has. So here it is, the implementation of this idea. We have the power stage M control as we had it before. I have now added another ABM, analog behavioral model. This is the integration of the voltage across the inductor here. So what I'm going to get here is something of this nature. I'm going to have the low frequency component as well. So in order to get just a high frequency component, which I'm interested in, this is the high pass filter. And then I am adding, after the high pass filter, I'm going to have this high frequency component. And then I'm adding a envelope detector. This is an envelope detector. So I'll get this value. So this here is the high frequency component of the, this volt second of the inductor. And this here envelope is exactly the thing that I need. And now I can take it and take it to the power of 2.9 according to this particular beta that I'm working with. And here are the results. This is the volt second. This is after taking out the low frequency component. This is the envelope. Here's the envelope. And here is the envelope to the power of 2.9. Now, obviously, the power dissipation would be a function of the average of this thing. So I'm taking the average of this envelope to the power of 2.9. And here, this is the number that I need. Here it is. So, the core loss is Steinmetz equation. B is this value. B is now related to the volt second. B to the hat to power of 2.9 is this. So, the power loss, which is this Steinmetz equation, is this components here, these components here, which all are known. This is the Steinmetz fitting, this is the information about the core, and the value that I've just found. This is the average of the volt second hat to the power of 2.9. Plugging this into the equation will give me the power loss per centimeter cube, and of course, knowing the volume, I can find the total power loss of the core. Now I've also run another example just to show that uh, the waveform could be entirely different. Here I have increased the input to 325 volt peak, which is uh, 220 uh, RMS, and um, then this is a 2 milli Henry rather than the 500 micro Henry because of the lower current I'm going to use, and I'm getting a lower current by putting here some constant 8.25 um, the multiplying the voltage here so that uh, the coefficient will be different so therefore the input resistance will be higher okay so this is just adjusting the current and here are the results for this particular case this is now the inductor current i'm getting now you see that the peak value is lower than we had before this is what we had before and also the waveform of the high frequency ripple here is different here we have a maximum here this is because of the very low uh, input voltage while here the the peak value is approaching 400 volt so therefore the uh, ripple here is actually lower and it's at the midway it's it's higher and this is just the extracting the AC or the high frequency, I should say, component of the ripple. This is the ripple component of the inductor current. And here is again the volt second. So this is the volt second, the high frequency component of which. This is the envelope after the envelope peak detection. And this is to the power of 2.9. And this is the average value of this power. So once we have the waveform, it is rather easy to extract the information that we need. And the information here is 
the high frequency component of the inductor current, the high frequency component of the magnetic flux density variation, the envelope of which, and then of course uh, doing the math uh, to the power of beta uh, according to the particular material that we are using. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it interesting and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.